Thanks to all of you, Fishing DMV hit its major milestone on Patreon of 150 Patreon subscribers. This Saturday, August 17th at 6 p.m. at Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia, we'll be having our very first meet and greet. Food will be provided free of charge to all Patreon members. We'll also have special merchandise that'll be going out, again, free to all Patreon members. Again, it'll be August 17th at 6 p.m. See you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. It's been a week after the aftermath on the Susquehanna River, and we have two winners here. We have winner number one, who is a uh, Bill, from I think day one, if, if Jake is not mistaken here, from the Mid-Atlantic Kayak Association's day one competition. And then we have day two, the winner of everything on the river, <laughs> every tournament he signed up for. Uh, you know him, you love one. Uh, Erwin, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Winner of the Bassmaster Kayak uh, Extravaganza and also the Mid-Atlantic day two. Holy crap, that was an insane weekend. I think it was over, what, 200 kayaks that entered the tournament, allegedly. It, I, that's the biggest showing I've ever heard of for a kayak event in recent years. It was 224, and I believe that it, it, the Susquehanna River has ever had on it as far as uh, kayak tournaments go. I would say probably any tournaments, but 224. Going into this event, for anyone who wants to to speak on this, when you hear that there's going to be that many kayaks on the water, does that affect your practice at all? Uh, so, yeah, Ewing, you go ahead and answer that first. You uh, won the whole thing. I mean, I I definitely tried to look at a few things that I wouldn't have normally looked at, but I ended up fishing the same old kind of areas that everyone fishes. Um, it's hard to win where the fish aren't, and there's a – I don't know how there's, I mean, it's, it was probably about half of the river that was inbounds was one set up right to, to catch them good. And then two just having the fish to, to be able to have a shot at winning the tournament. So you just kind of didn't have an option. You had to fish around people is what I think it came down to. How much of the river did you break down beforehand? Um, I practiced for three days and hit My spot. two launches on the first day and then three the both of the, the later two days. Bill? Uh, I actually pre-fished from Saturday, Sunday, then Monday to Friday. Uh, I wanted to fish some uh, areas I typically don't fish. I knew Everybody it was going to be fish. crowded. So I uh, actually I went down kind of south, further south than I normally would, and I located a good concentration of fish there, and I just decided that's all I need to see. So I'm going to hit that area both days. Jake, it looks like you're still practicing for something. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm fishing. Uh, so I, I practiced on the days that I had off, and uh, I, I guess you could say I practiced. I mean, most of all history for me and Bill and Oh, even Ewing at this point, it's a lot of history for him too. Like, yeah, you know, I just went to a bunch of spots that I didn't think I was going to fish on tournament day. And I was just looking to try to pattern those fish and try to come up and see like what they were doing. And by and large, the fish were middle of the river around, I think would have been the, probably the, the best pattern. I don't know if the other two guys can confirm that or not. How many, how many years, when you look at like the St. Lawrence River is a classic example of this, where the first couple of times when people went up there, 100% the northern guys dominated. And now that it's been about 30 years in a row, it feels like that bass has gone to the St. Lawrence. It feels like the advantage from northern anglers, it's still a decent one, but a lot of southern anglers has caught up because they've gone there the same time every single year. With the, Saint, with, with, with the Susquehanna, 
and the Hobie and Bass going there, has it gotten to the point where the familiarity is kind of baked into the cake for a lot of the, the anglers that go there? Yeah, there are very I mean, few anglers that went up there that had never seen it before. Um, any of the regular people that go to all of the tournaments, they're going to know it fairly well. Uh, whether that helps or not, I mean, the my first trip up there, I caught them really good, just being able to understand a river in general. And I think what it, that's more of what it comes down to because even if you're – You've been to the river a few times. Someone that fishes a river on a regular basis that has never seen it before, I think, is going to have a better chance at competing than someone that has only fished that river to be their their moving water, but it's only been during the select times that we've gone. I, I think um, one thing that protects the river from people completely – it and, and grasping it is each time we come here the water levels have been considerably different the exception of like this year this year we had a little bump but like the first year we came here it was it was a drought um, the second year we came here it was a flood the year after that that we came here it was you know it was a little bit in between a drought and normal. And then this one was a little bit ahead of like above normal. So the river levels and flow levels and stuff have been different each time that you've come here. And I think we've also came, um, the Hobie typically came in the summertime, but last year Bassmaster came in the fall and that's a completely different pattern. Well, basically any, anything would work in the fall, but, um, you know, it, it's, the time of year and I think the flow rates definitely have made a difference or made a made a difference in like protecting or keeping people from knowing exactly what to do, if that makes any sense. If I'm not mistaken, Ewing, I think your brother won during the drought tournament. I think it was the Hobie one though, because yeah. uh, I've talked to him and, and I think our mutual, mutual friend Ethan Stone of New River Outfielders about that, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Did was there any parallels with that event and how this one kind of shaped up just from the conditions? No, not at all. It was, it was very similar to actually last summer I made a trip up there with, it was one of my friend's birthdays and he just wanted to go catch smallmouth somewhere. And I said, well, this is the best place without going all the way North. And we loaded up the kayaks and the conditions were almost identical to it. So they were set up in the same ways in the same places. Uh, had to adjust a little bit due to pressure, but I mean, that's what you get with 220 some kayakers out there. Was that kind of, I think there's two different types of pressure. It's like the game day pressure and the adjustments you make and just kind of just like the cyclical thing. So Lake Anna between Memorial Day, Labor Day, you just know that there's going to be 6,000 boats at 11 AM. That's just pressure that's always going to happen versus the Potomac river, you know, this one weekend there's going to be three tournaments and that's like a, mm -hmm. that day is going to be a lot of pressure. Did you have to make the adjustments in practice or was it literally knowing on game day that there's going to be a shit ton of kayaks? And I just have to figure out on the fly, the adjustments that have to be made. I mean, it was, it was the whole week. It was constantly adjusting. They, they never really did the exact same thing. Any one of the days that I was there, I mean, the water level was changing a bunch and just people fishing and, and beating up the fish because they're, I don't think any fish in the river got to spend it any more than two hours um, without seeing a bait. It was, it was very, very crowded, but also just looking for places that a big fish might set up that other people would, wouldn't even think to, to throw at. Um, I had a few little one cast deals that, that I found during the tournament, but they, they, uh, they produced fish on both days. Bill. Oh uh, yeah. Like, like Ewing said, uh, with that rise, it kind of threw out everything that I found in practice that, you know, kind of repositioned the fish. So you have to make adjustments with that, but I'd say also with the pressure, I had to make adjustments in tournament just within, you know, a few hours of each other, just constantly evolving and changing things up. 
day one starts and let's go i guess we'll go yeah, saturday through sunday let's go with that so day one starts what happens when you guys get out there to your for your primary spot does it happen quickly initially or is it actually a slow build to get to where you ended the day actually it's very quick in the morning I mean, that, that morning bite's so important when you're talking about summertime fishing we got pretty quick and then you kind of get that mid-morning wall and had to make some adjustments and once I did that, they started getting getting there. I guess I'd say they were starting to feed probably around 11, 11.30. And that's when things picked up again all the way till the end of the day. When I had the winter on for the Juniana event that happened, it was back in June, but it talked about like how the topwater bite was kind of spotty and they were just throwing a lot of treble hooks. Was that an issue that you were worried about in practice relying too much on a potential topwater bite if it existed? Not really. I knew we could get it to play in the morning, and you can somewhat in the afternoon, but I found I had to make adjustments and went to, like, a wake bait and went to a uh, swim bait finally to a five-inch that I was kind of waking along the top of the surface. It's just something less obnoxious, but still a good-sized bait. So, I mean, I was there... Wednesday through Sunday, and I didn't catch a fish that wasn't on some form of top water. So I just, the water was right to catch big ones on top. So I just, you know, you know, you're going to lose some big fish, but that's how you get your big bites. So might not get as many as, as someone that's throwing about anything else on that river, but, but that's the way to, to trick the right size ones. And so you didn't feel like the pressure kind of affected it at all throughout oh, the week? It did. it did. Absolutely did. Those fish were terrified of a chopo <laughs> end of it. You'd throw it up next to a grass island instead of waking towards it when it hits the water, they'd wake away. It was yeah. It's some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen on that river. They don't they usually don't get smart to it, but they definitely did. Yeah, I feel like a whopper plop drawer after that weekend is kind of like a helicopter in Vietnam. They probably have PTSD every time they hear that sucker come like screaming over their head. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake, did you at all try to dabble in the top water? Yeah, that was um. So my my the area that I primarily fish, I it was it was going to be a complete top water all day long for me. Um, I had enough shade that I, I that the top water would work. Um, I missed two really big bites early on day one that really kind of put me behind a little bit. That was like my, my a one spot that I missed. Bites. Um, and you know, I had to kind of struggle. I struggled a little bit throughout the day because missing those fish and teaching them, you know, and spooking them really, um, kind of put me in a bad spot, but I ended up day, day one with like 92 and three quarter inches. I think I was in like 20th someplace. Mm. So <laughs> everybody, everybody for the most part caught them pretty good. Do you change out your triple hooks at all? I do. Triple grips or like more of like a finesse Aaron Martin style? Um, I, I like owner ST 36s. Okay. Um, I know Billy likes a certain hook. I'm not going to tell him what it is if he doesn't want to tell it. I think Billy's on the right track with the hook that he uses. Sorry, Jeff's already told the whole world. <laughs> it It's interesting because I, I, I had this uh, epiphany during a Patreon stream where I feel like I force smallmouth to jump more with bait caster than spinning equipment just by the nature of I feel like I have more control so I pull on them more which then makes them jump, which that makes them throw the hooks versus if I hook one on six pound test and a spinning rod, I just let the drag go and I'm actually working them correctly. When you're dealing with the top water bite, is it just haul on their ass and hope to God it works out? Or do you actually try to get them to stay down? Like what do you have a strategy when dealing with these big river smallmouth this time of year? I've got a pencil sharpen these fish, man, because they're only in like two feet of water. What does that so they mean? Really, like you just got to like, Brian in a pencil sharpener. Okay. Old school. Um, like they, they don't have anywhere to go but up. <laughs> uh, moving on from that. 
so day one, um, Ewing, what, after you started, like, when did you feel like things were starting to click? Was it right away or at, again, did it slow build for you? No, I, I don't think I had a, actually, I know I didn't have a single fish that I even wanted to be the smallest one in my limit in the first hour. And that was very concerning, but I mean, I, I kind of, I slid up further, further inside of the islands and stuff than I, I had at all during practice because I just wasn't around the right size fish. I was getting bites, but I could tell they, they weren't the right ones. And when I pushed up, it, it happened really quick. And I think in like two hours, I caught everything that I had on day one. And I didn't want to, even though there was a lot of people fishing around, I didn't want to present my bait how I wanted to, to all of the stuff that I was going to fish the next day. So I leaned off of them and I just went exploring after like, 9 30. Wow. so th when you're talking about the islands was it a group of islands and then it was that specific islands that you slide in closer to or was it a new set that you just ran to there's there are just it's one of those stretches of river that everywhere you look is islands um, gotcha well, most of the rivers that way but yeah it's just i'm constantly fishing islands the whole time and I knew there was a good population of bigger fish there. And I, I really felt like after I saw what happened on day one, I felt like I shouldn't have leaned off of them. But I think that's that's really what ended up helping me close that gap and actually catch them on day two. Unlike a lot of people that, that struggled, I think they just beat on their fish too much. Because even if someone else is, is fishing the same water you're planning on, they're not, they're probably not throwing the exact bait, the exact presentation, the way you're, you're bringing your bait past it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just, I feel better when I'm not catching them. Cause I know if I, you know, exactly where I throw my bait, if I'm going to do the same thing the next day, I might not catch. It could be one or two bites that I got that, that would end up being the difference in the, the next day. So with that said, and you said you wanted to explore more water, was your plan going to day two exploring completely new stuff and just keep moving? Or was it trying to keep defining that spot within a spot that you found on Saturday? Uh, I was just, I just really beat down hard on the, the stuff that I knew was good. It wasn't any particular spot, but running more of a pattern and just trying to stay with them all day. And I went through little spurts where, you know, they'd be doing something and you catch them, you catch three or four in, in 45 minutes, and then you don't catch another fish for an hour and a half. And then you figure out something else that they're doing, but it was constantly changing as well as in mean, the water level on both days was, it was up, it was down, just, I'm sure the fish were as confused as, as most people were when when they uh, started dropping the water because it was day one, it started high and then dropped throughout the day and then it spiked back up overnight and then dropped again on day two. So mm. it was very strange conditions. Um, but I was able to just keep an open mind and, you know, not all the, not get too, too locked in on, on one particular pattern. I was throwing the same baits, but just the, the that was throwing them chains throughout the day. The unique thing about the Susquehanna, and the only place around me that's kind of like that is the upper Potomac after the confluence of the Shenandoah and the Potomac where it gets kind of wide. Because mm -hmm. like the, if you fish a Shenandoah event, New River, really, you fish you know north to south, upstream, downstream. There you can fish left to right. So when, it sounds like, and I could be saying for all of you, you guys just pick a section and you basically fish all of it, right? Because unless you have like 38 batteries in your boat, I guess. And is that the plan is just to find a good school? And this is just generic one on one. So I find a good school and then you're just trying to figure out where they move with the water fluctuation. I mean, to an extent, there will be sections that I like smaller sections that I fish, you know, the whole way across. Um, and then other places I'm just burning through and trying to get, get further up river. But on day one, I fished six miles up 
Jesus, and then all the way wow. to, I, I only fished like four and a half miles up river, but I did a single access. That way I was always presenting my bait from downstream. What is all of your guys' opinion on rehitting spots, especially in smallmouth derbies? Is it just you hit it once and you're done and you move on? Are there places you like to check back on throughout the day? I, I hit on day two, I hit everything at least twice. Um, cause I mean, a lot of the times there's two or three small mouths sitting in a spot, uh, and you're only going to catch one of those. They usually follow it out, spook, and then you got to give them at least an hour or so to reset. But it can also be, you know, there's a small mouth up against this grass island the first time I fish it, or he's not against the grass island the first time I fish it. Maybe it's 15 feet away, just sitting on a ledge, not, not doing much. And then when it, you know, it's just when your bait's going through there, if there's a fish that's pulled up looking to feed is when you catch them. So it's, you know, you could miss any spot by 10 minutes and they're just 30 yards to your left and, and you don't even throw a bait over them. So cycling back through. Uh, works. If I could also, if I could talk on that part, um, day two, it, towards the end of the day, I found a shade bank that had, it was, had an undercut bank on it. And I was fishing it and I caught an 18 and three quarters off of it. So I kind of like posted up there knowing that it was a shaded bank with an undercut bank. I kind of figured that it would eventually reload. Um, I, I didn't catch any more fish that were upgrades off of it. Um, but towards the like very last 15 minutes of the tournament, I, I left the spot and I made a last ditch effort to go up to the front of an island and I go up to the front of the island and I thought I was far enough off of the tip of the island. I was probably like, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 yards off to the left of the island whenever I was cruising up by it. And I, I went right over two really big small mountains. I was like, man, I was like, I wasn't expecting them to be this far off the island, but probably just had gotten their faces beat in from being so close to the islands all all long that they started pulling off a, a pretty good base. That's interesting. Yeah, I kind of like I I definitely believe it. I think Jeff Little coined this, but I'll steal it from him is the big small mouth will pick about three or four areas and they just rotate through it. And you just got to make sure you're at the right place at the right time. I, I had a, after this tournament, actually, I had a friend of mine who, again, he's a jet boat guy, river rat. I feel like where I live, it's just all small mouth river. And he's like, why is it tubes and, and Ned rigs never win these events? And I'm like, that's a damn good question, honestly. Cause I know that pretty much most river rats have that tied on, but, Jake and and you know we we have friends that like only want to fish slow, but all these tournaments it's usually power fishing techniques. Is it just because that's the culture of tournament fishing is to be more powerful, or is it just something that's overlooked? It's really I think it's mainly the Susquehanna. With there's so many places that you can hit in a day that a fish would be pulled up and actively feeding, whereas on a different river like you've got two banks and then ledges in the middle and you yeah. have to you know slow down a little more and, and fish tube ned rig that type of stuff like i think the the new river bos event was was one on a ned rig um just because of the the style of river you can't cover as much water and there's not as much i guess there's not as much habitat to spread the fish and anglers out I agree with that. That makes sense to me. Bill, you got some thoughts? Well, the only other thing I can think of with that is water level, time of year has a lot to do with it too. I mean, you're dealing with pretty shallow water. You're pretty limited on your choices of what you can throw. And you get to be in real clear water. You have to kind of have that mentality of you're going to have to run and gun, hit a lot of spots, and just be as efficient as you can. Was yeah, there ever I, go for it? I just think the the more casts you make, the more chances you have it hooking into a big fish here. Um, and obviously, like that's kind of you know it sounds dumb to say that, but really, like there's so many. If you're out there fishing with a Ned rig, you know you're not making nearly as many casts 
more than likely a small fish is probably going to pick that Ned rig up and you're going to end up wasting a lot of time. I just feel like the bigger the bait, the, the more aggressive it is, the more appealing fish is for the bald eagle. Um, it just, I feel like you set yourself up for success, giving yourself more chances to take fish by power fishing. Hmm. Could they actually, Jake, could they hold an event this size on the Juniata? Not even I think remotely. You said no. Okay. Not even, not a chance. Um, the Juniata, honestly, depending on how, how much of it you open up, Juniata is probably for about 50 to 75. That's crazy. Because that's off limits, right? It's just the Susquehanna proper. There was the Juniata was in play. Um, somebody that there was a couple people I think that cashed check up in the Juniata. Damn. Um, but the Juniata in the summertime it fishes. Yeah. Like if the river is half the size of Hannah, let's just say it's half the size. About a quarter of that half is in play in the Juniata. The other the other three quarters isn't. Mm. That makes really, sense. I mean. Do you agree with that, Bill? Oh, definitely. Definitely. It, it fishes very small, especially in the summer. Interesting. Yeah, because like that's another place that it's been really cool to actually investigate more. It's just like a, a it sounds like a smaller version of the Susquehanna, but it just doesn't get the same love that it really does. Neither is Conowingo. Lake Conowingo is really fascinating. I'm actually going to go up there and probably shoot a YouTube video this fall because that place, I mean, you guys turned me on to that. That place is cool as hell, and there needs to be more hype about that place. Yeah. But moving I mean, on. I, the Juniata, the draw for the Juniata is truly springtime. There's big fish in the all, but springtime it loads up spawning fish from the river. And when I say it's Jurassic Park springtime, it's it's Jurassic Park at springtime for smallmouth bass. Like it is wild. If it's like able Belmont to have, Bay. Yeah, but if we would have our fix on the Juniata. I 100% believe that it would have taken a hunt to win that one day. Jesus. Billy? That's crazy. Billy, do you agree with that? At least, at least high the mid nineties easily. Is a hundred inches the cap or do you think you could actually have a hundred and you know, five, 110, something absolutely bonkers for a small mouth event? Hundred and five, a hundred, anything over one oh, be incredibly difficult on the river. We don't, we don't have a lot of twenty-one and twenty-two inch fish. We have a, we have a metric ton of. I had to censor myself there. We have, a, we have a lot of nineteens and twenties, but th those twenty ones and twenty twos are pretty rare. You need at least one or one or two of those. One oh five number, anything over that one oh two, one oh three. Like, it's just not as common. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Jake, what is something... Yeah. And I just ripped the Band-Aid off here. What's something that you learned, we'll say it that way, from this event? Something that you would do differently? I wouldn't do a single thing different. I, I, the area that I was in was, was great. It held... I, the area that I was in, there was, uh, I think, six checks cashed from. Um, I maybe, I maybe might would have gone somewhere different at the end of day two. I probably would have put it somewhere. Um, but I, I don't think I would have changed tactics or changed location because the area that I was in was fantastic. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of people that were cash and checks in my area. Uh, the only thing that I wish would have went different for me is I wish I would have fished clean on day one and then maybe potentially just made like made a business decision to go somewhere else at the end of day two because it got really tough at the end of day two where I was at having all the people there. Um, but if I would have fished clean on day one, I mean, I would have been right up there with Billy probably. I'm assuming. I, I, I don't know because I didn't catch those fish, but they were definitely big bite. When, 
And this is, were you fishing for points or just purely the wind? Because my next question would be like, if you're fishing just for a wind, does that change the way you fish? And does that also make it more of a feast or famine thing with what happened in the day? I mean, I was fishing for a wind because Ewing got on my Facebook and said that he, so I, I really wanted to beat him because of that. I was also fishing for a win, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> no. no, I haven't. I haven't fished any other bass. Man. So the point, none of that. I, for me, it was like, you know, it was go big or go home. Like I don't care if I, you know, like I wanted a top five, no matter what. That that was what I expected, and that's because the previous two years I had a third and fourth place, and it's like anything less than that was what it, you know, was a failure on my, on my, my mindset. That's what it was. But, mm. uh, I wasn't fishing for points. I was just a big fish. Does that set you up for failure or success when you put it? Like, I'm just curious. Cause like, I've had this conversation with a couple of guys before where I can't swing for the fence because I will, I'll overswing. I have to say, I'm just going to square the ball up every time I hit singles and I'll hit a home run eventually. That's my, that's when I have success. But if I literally go up there as the guy that swings to the fence, I can't hit row. So is that, is that too much of a mindset to have to be like, I have to like, you know, fish to win. Cause I've always been fascinated about people that say that, that I'm just going to fish to win. It's like, well, no shit. It's like, I'm going out there to win the game. But is that putting too much? Does it make you overlook obvious things? I don't think I don't think it did for me. I don't know. Maybe somebody else will probably have a better answer for you because mine is very simple and short. I mean, with the Susquehanna, like you go up there, you look at the water level, you know how it's going to be won. You just don't know who or where. Like. If with with the water level, we knew it was going to be one on, you know, some sort of top water, and I think almost every single person in the in the top, probably every person that got checks at least had a few big fish on top water, whether they caught them all on it or not. There was, I don't think there was a single person that didn't have one on top water. Was there a moment? I'll go, Jack. I just I was agreeing one hundred percent with you. Um, I think I would say probably ninety five percent of the top twenty people in this tournament more than likely were throwing top water. Some version variation of it. You know, in a tournament like that, where it's that kind of cut and dry, like when they go up to um, the Mississippi and everyone's throwing a damn frog, it's like no spoilers there. What's the separator then? Is it just being at the right place at the right time or is it just doing something a little different with your top water presentation? I think it's all of the above. I mean, first of all, I, I think what, what really helped me was efficiency. Just being able to, I don't, I truly believe I made more cast on that river than anyone else did the, on, well, at least day two. Um, just being able to, always cast i didn't stop casting even if i wasn't you know fishing anything in particular i always had a bait in the water um and then right place right time a little bit of luck and you you put it all together and i think with that all doing is saying about always having a bait in the water there's also something to be said for presenting that bait correctly because you can you can put a bait in the water all day long and not catch fish but if you're accurate with your cast and, you know, it's one of the things that, that a, a true river fish has an advantage over a lot of other people fish these, this type of body of water when they come here. We know that when we're moving river to, to, you know, to advance, we might be on one cast. We're looking ahead at one or two or maybe even three casts ahead because by the time we get our bait in, we're trying to, we're trying to launch that bad boy right back out there. And you've got to kind of have that target in mind. If you don't have that target in mind, you're probably going to miss a lot of fish. You're probably going to not hit the, the area that you want to hit. If you hit it the wrong place, you're probably going to spook that fish versus. Yeah, he's definitely right on that. Like every time I would approach an area, I'd already 
as I'm reeling in my first cast, I'm making up my mind of where does, does my boat need to be to make this cast, this cast, this cast, and this cast without spooking any fish that would be in that area. Cause they are extremely shallow. And if, if you make one mistake, you'll, you'll spook every single one out of the area. Interesting. Was there a moment going into day two, like you really, you had that gut check back at the hotel or campsite about, okay, this is what I got to do. Cause I actually got a chance to do a thing. Or did you even have those thoughts at that point after day one? I mean, I thought I could move up and I knew I had a shot at, at winning if I put up a, you know, 93 to 95 inches. Um, because it's really, really hard to put up that. I mean, when you put up 98 inches, I know that person has, has really put, put a hurting on their fish just because of the amount of fish that you have to cycle through to get those upper 19 and 20 inch fish. Um, and I just, that was my confidence was, I know I didn't burn all my stuff. I have fish left. I had to completely change as the day went by, but you know, just keeping an open mind and, and adjusting with, with pressure and conditions. We, we talked about adjustments. And something we talked about off air was, you know, kayaking versus boating. If you were going to get hot, if you were going to hop in a boat and, and fish a boat tournament, what is one of the bigger adjustments that would have to be made? I mean, I've got to do it every single time. The first thing is casting. It's a whole lot different casting, standing up and sitting down. Um, Agreed. Setting the hook boat, for me. Oh, setting the hook. I mean, in a boat, you can kind of cast anywhere 360 cast. degrees around your boat. And you can set the hook almost perfect every single time. In a kayak, you have to think like, all right, I don't want to be casting right over here with, you know, a, something that you have to set the hook. Um, you just have to always be anticipating a bite because if you're if your kayak's out of position, you're out of position. You're not going to get a hook good hook set and, and probably lose that fish. Mindset wise, when it comes to strategy and execution of that strategy, going from a kayak to a boat is, I feel like that's way harder. I feel like it's easier. I could be wrong. This is my mindset. It was easier for me to go from a boat to a kayak because it took away things. Like I can't move. I have to be better at more precise with everything. It's not a kid in the candy store, but when you have a boat and you all of a sudden say like the whole river is yours. How, how the hell do you shut those voices up without medication? I mean, really just every time that I'm in a boat and I'm thinking, okay, this spot over here, I just got to think back to myself. All right. Like if I was in my kayak, I'd probably mm. end up catching them just around that bend because I'm not going to give in so fast. And I, <clears throat> sometimes it does hurt me because I get a little too stubborn in a boat, but then other times it's just like I hit the spot too early and I had to, you know, wait them out or whatever. But I try to move as little as possible in a boat just because that is really what kayak fishing put me onto is, is there's a lot more fish in an area than you would know. And even with today's electronics, there's no way of telling how many fish are somewhere. Um, but just having confidence that what I found in practice has enough fish um, instead of bailing on it and going somewhere else. Uh, that's usually a last minute thing. And, and I also feel like it's hard in an eight hour day, even if you know the body of water really well to find that spot within the spot when you just keep moving. Versus mm -hmm. if you are staying in an area, you get so intimate with it. And I dare anyone listening to this. If you just stay in one cove or creek for eight hours, you will, it's so crazy how you become so, I don't know, familiar with that place on another level where all of a sudden you see that the fish are setting up on this post, not that post. And you find those little sweet spots. And maybe there's some people like thrift or something like that that can do that on a whole lake, but I don't have that ability just to drop down on a spot and know, okay, this is the, the meta of this area. Indefinitely, when I go to like a boat tournament on a place that I've 
had a kayak tournament in the past, the areas that I have fished out of my kayak, I know every single little thing about it and I can, you know, fish those areas more effectively because I was just, you know, forced to fish slower through stuff and, and notice more about it. Bill, with, with this big win, I think this, this kind of wraps up the, the mid Atlantic series for you guys. And you do have the Delaware tournament coming up here shortly. What did you think of your season so far as a whole? Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. I kind of cut back this year a little bit. Um, I have a couple injuries that prevent me from fishing a few tournaments. And with having to take a week off work to go out for the Bassmaster at the beginning of the year, that kind of burned up a lot of my vacation time. So I kind of had to pick and choose a little more this year. But uh, overall, with power, nothing stellar, but not terrible. Jake, as an angler and as a tournament director, what did you think so far of the year? So the tournament directing part is certainly really not, I wouldn't really call myself a director. Um, that's that's 100% Aaron Fetterman for us. Um, I will say as an angler, I was, um, honestly, I was a little bit preoccupied this motion of the events and in kind of helping Aaron make sure that they run off, you know, pretty smooth. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of time that's spent and it takes your, your mental focus away. Um, I didn't have the greatest year, but I also didn't have, I think I've caught a limit in every, every event this, year. so, you know, that's the first step. That's what you got to do. Um, I, I think for the series, yet I don't know this to be certain yet, but I think MAKBF this year had their best series ever, best year ever as far as goes. Um, we've averaged about fifty-eight people per event. Um, we've paid out over twenty thousand dollars already this year. We've had a total of four hundred people register between across seven events so we've had a, a very very good year and um you know that that's that's something that i know everybody on the leadership group aaron matt uh aaron fetterman matt campbell josh evans trey leach and myself but we we all kind of hanging our hats on that a little bit this year because this economy, it's hard to do what we did this year, and we it better than any year previous. So, right on. Did you want to, um, since we're finishing up here, did you want to give uh, any any sponsorship plugs for uh, the Mid Atlantic tournament? Yeah, I mean, first, you know, foremost, every year Delaware Paddles has been our title sponsor for for the MAKBF. Um, you know, DPS is, is just a great, great kayak shop. One of the biggest kayak shops in the whole country. Um, they deliver everywhere. If you're looking for a kayak and, and you know, you want to you wanna experience that tax-free Delaware uh, situation, I would encourage people to look to Delaware Paddle Sports for their, for their kayak needs. Um, for this specific event, our presenting sponsor was Beta Sportsman, which is Trey Leach. Uh, makes both the Osprey that I'm in, but the kayak accessories. Um, you know, Trey Trey invested in the series heavily, and uh, you know we we wouldn't have been able to pay out the money that we paid out for this event without him. And I know that Ewing and and uh, Ewing and Billy both pretty nice checks from a locals perspective. Um, I don't know exactly what Ewing had, but I I know that both both of them were i believe over fifteen hundred dollars and that's a pretty big deal on a on a um so you know without that you know without trey's support of the season so we're not you know we, we're not able to do that um the other sponsors that we had for this event specifically were bending branches kayak paddles um ego fishing with their nets and their grippers and other fishing accessories uh flask cap which this little deal right here. Um, 
a little it's a little tumbler keeps your drinks cold uh they them fishing online kayak pushing those are all big members of us this year and they were supporters of Susquehanna so huge thank you and shout out to them and looking for any discount go codes you can go to the MAKBF website and there's there's going to be discount code for a lot of our sponsors on their links on our sponsor page. So check that out. Ewing. No, mainly just uh dugout bait and tackle Jamie Coza. He's, I mean, he's a fisherman and a kayak fisherman. He's been in the, you know, tackle and, and fishing side of, of things for longer than I've been alive. So when he, you know, deals kayaks and stuff. He knows exactly what a fisherman wants. Um, it really shows in his rigging. He's he's always one step ahead of the game, and, and that, that helps a lot throughout the year. But um, Seaguar, I've been using their line since, well, since I started throwing fluorocarbon, and now I throw their braid too. It's I've always got confidence when I set the hook, they're coming in the boat, and uh, – Shimano G Loomis, uh, Newport Vessel Motors, and Enduro Power. Those, everyone there, they they keep me going on the road and, and on the water. So, very thankful for all their support. Bill? Uh, just Jackson Kayak and uh, Undercover Baits. There you have it, guys. So, what do you guys got coming up next? No, I'm leaving in the morning for Saginaw Bay for the Hobie BOS. That one, it's going to be a lot of green fish and a lot of braid squeaking. It's going to going to be a fun week. That's going to be a lot of fun. What is that, like a 10-hour drive from where you're at? No, it's nine. nine that's nine. nine. Not bad. Oh, that's easy then. Mm -hmm. Good Lord, that's a lot. Anything under 10, I'm just, just it's a breeze. Once you start getting up there. 12, 13, 14 hour drives are, are where I really start dreading it. Wait, what What would do a 14 hour drive for you be? Um, a lot of Texas events, believe it or not. Ooh. Yeah, that would suck. Ugh. Dude, that's a problem. That's the thing about this, the, the mid Atlantic and a lot of these other organizations that become regional. I said this on the show, even in boat, boat tournaments, like the elite seventies, that's going to be where it's at because shit like in this economy uh, jake you brought it up like it's just going to be harder and harder for people to drive to texas from the east coast and it's no knock against the texas fisheries it's just like the economy of things and it'll be interesting in the next you know five years to see if there's going to be more hot regional organizations that pop up that pay out better and better to where it's like do you do the hobie or the bass or do you just stay local and, and that, that was honestly, that was the market that we tried to explore here um, because it is a lot harder to travel all over the country. Um, so, you know, w we we did our best to work with national series to not have events overlapping them. But, I mean, our, our, our priority this year was to give our anglers an opportunity to still fish for a lot of money but not have to travel – 10 plus hours on a one-way trip to get somewhere to do it. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was that was a market that we absolutely tried to exploit this year. Well, as always, gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to have you guys on. Link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Huge shout out to Ewing for winning day two of the Mid-Atlantic Series and also the Bassmaster kayak event on the Susquehanna River. And then Bill for winning day one of the Mid-Atlantic Series and for Jake just for being outside and being here with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, check us out on Facebook, Patreon, and also you can check us out on Apple. We just cracked into the top. I think it was like 120 of all podcasts, and I really, really want to kind of beat out Akinelli next year. That's kind of like my hope and dream. So please go give us a review, like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.